Hey there, welcome to Grace at Home. My name is Matt and I'm the online director here at Grace Church. If you're new to our church, man, I'm really excited that you've taken some time to be with us today. And thanks for just checking us out. To say thanks to you, I'd love to buy your next cup of coffee or a breakfast sandwich for you sometime this week. Just text the word new to the number that you see on your screen and let me know what email that I can use so that I can get that to you. Now, we're in a teaching series called At The Movies and it's our second week. The idea behind it is that every week we're highlighting a different movie or a part of that movie as an illustration to help us digest and apply certain truths from the Bible to our lives. So let's get started and then after the teaching, I'll be back to give you some next steps that you can take this next week. Hey guys, I'm Jason Cross, church plant resident here at Grace Church, and I have the privilege of continuing our series at the movies. Last week, Pastor Brandon talked about rest, intentional Sabbath rest. Today, I wanna talk to you about not getting too comfortable in that rest. So it's the summertime, and we know that that means it's time to take a load off. I mean, around this time, we like to kick off our shoes, relax our feet, Nothing but barbecue and sweet summertime vibes. Of course, relaxing is okay. That's until it spills over and becomes spiritual stubbornness and even worse, complacency. Last week, we used the movie What About Bob to drive home the point of making intentional time to take rest in the Lord. This week, We're using the Lion King to illustrate the point of not becoming complacent with that rest to the point that it becomes sinful disobedience to God's will for our lives. Now, in the movie, The Lion King, if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. It's a great movie. Simba, who's the main character, finds himself filled with guilt and shame because he was convinced by his uncle Scar that he was responsible for his father, King Mufasa's death. His uncle also uses the same rationale to convince Simba that he should run away and never return to assume the throne as king of Pride Rock. In the midst of his wandering, Simba encounters Pumbaa and Timon, a warthog and a meerkat, who are living what they call the Hakuna Matata lifestyle. What this simply means is that they have no worries and it's a problem-free philosophy. They just sit around all day eating bugs, farting, drinking water, whatever happens, happens. They're not very intentional about their movements. Now, of course, this philosophy appealed to Simba because he's carrying the guilt and shame of believing that he was responsible for his father's death. See, when we carry heavy weight, we look for any opportunity to put him down. Fortunately, God has not called us to bear the heavy weights. In fact, the Bible says this in Hebrews 12:1. Therefore, Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Simba sets down the weight of shame and guilt and becomes complacent. He becomes so complacent that he grows from a cub learning this new philosophy to an adult leading the charge. So what is complacency? Well, complacency is a smug or uncritical satisfaction with oneself or one's achievements. Simba became happy with his buy-in to the Hakuna Matata lifestyle and he got stuck. Spiritually, it's coming to the point where we become overconfident with where we are at in God and his provisions, and we start to believe that we're no longer responsible for participating in intentional growth towards God's mission and agenda in the earth. The truth is that the fruit of complacency is consumption. When we allow ourselves to become complacent in our faith walk with God, we become consumed by whatever we take on as a mean to abandon the weight 
that we should not be carrying in the first place. This happens because, just like Simba, we are living our faith from a place of worry versus a place of patient concern towards the area God has called us to participate in his will to bring his creation back into communion with him. What I really like to teach us today is how we avoid the trap of complacency. Let's look at God's word. In Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, it says this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through, through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty conscience has been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another with acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now as the day of his return is drawing near. Verse 22 say, right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Just two things before we move on. I just want to point out that the writer is reminding his audience here that they no longer need the priest to go to God for them but rather they can speak to God for themselves because of what Jesus did on the cross. And Jesus shed blood and water baptism makes us spiritually clean in God's eyes. So in this passage, since we're talking about complacency, I want to, I want to, I want to help us to see that the author points out six anti-complacent commands in this passage. Number one, he says, hold tightly without wavering in the hope that we affirm. That is an action. See, holding tightly indicates that we're not letting go, right? We're keeping our faith alive and active. We're always living our life with our faith at the forefront. We're holding on to that in the midst of challenges, when we become comfortable, when we're resting, when we feel exhausted, when life gets hard, we're holding tightly to our faith. That, that indicates this, this sense of God, I won't let go. It's a fight to keep holding on. We can't do that when we're complacent because we are saying when we're complacent, Ah, my faith is strong enough. It's it's come as far as it's going to come and it's not going anymore. We begin to let go. When, when we do that, the tightness of holding on to faith begins to ease. We begin to let go. We begin to let our spiritual guard down. But the writer is reminding us that we got to hold tightly to our faith and not let go. It's an action here. The second thing he tells us to do is trust God. When human beings hear the word trust, it does something on the inside of us. I mean, there are not too many people who you can talk to about trust that, that it doesn't bring up something for them on the inside. Maybe it's who they can't trust or the only kinds of people they do trust or why they have trust issues or what they've been through around trust. The writer is reminding us we can trust God and trust is an action thing. It's not about uh, trust reminds us to keep on allowing ourselves to be vulnerable to the things of God because we can trust 
what God says. It's an action thing. It's not about set. God did this thing before. And so I just, uh, I'm going to allow him to do that same thing. When God does something at one point in time, it is for our growth to happen in what he does so that the next time we encounter something different, we have a trust built on that relationship, but we practice faith that God is going to do something for what we are going through in that moment. That's why Jesus told us to ask God for daily bread. He didn't say ask for yesterday's manna. He said ask for daily bread, what we need for today. That's an action of trusting God. The third thing he said, think of ways to motivate others. That's an action thing. If we're thinking, the, the actual act of thinking is action. Because what we're doing is we're sitting around, we're saying in our head, how do I help other people stay motivated in following Jesus? We don't do that from a complacent place. The only way you do that is when you're constantly involved in putting yourself in God's hands. Because you're saying, I want to be available to what God is doing. And so I want to be in the position to say, hey, how do I help somebody else know Jesus better? When we're actively participating in what God is doing, that's when we find ourselves thinking about other ways to motivate people. If we're not motivated about doing what God has called us to do and what God has asked us to do, why in the world will we be thinking about anybody else being motivated? We're checked out ourselves. We're complacent about where we are. We start to give up on other people as well. That's why the writer, writer reminds us, think about other ways to motivate people. It's action. He said, commit acts of love and good work. Again, action. We're being asked to do something. Acts of love, love our neighbors, show people what the love of Christ looks like. Every time we present ourselves for an act of love, we are doing what Jesus called us to do. Love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and love our neighbors as we love ourself. Commit acts of love, and those acts of love take place in our home, they take place in our job, they take place in our community. They take place at our churches. Wherever we are, we are to be committing acts of love and good works. Put ourselves on a line that God would be glorified through us. And we do these things. We do them when we're not being complacent. Complacency causes us to cast off or push to the side opportunities to show God's love. It's action. Don't neglect meeting together. Oh, this is big right now because there's so many people who says, I'm not going back. The pandemic has happened. It's caused people to stay home and for good reason at time. But it's time to come back. It's time to return to the place that has helped you build up your faith as it is safely to do so. We've done a good job here at making sure we follow all the protocols to keep people safe. We're masking up. We wipe down surfaces. And we find that as people are, are, are cooperating with health protocols, healthy protocols, we can get back together. And so come on back. Don't let uh, the spirit of complacency keep you at home. It's better for me to just uh, lay around because what happens is you check out on the online services. Your your bed, I'll call it bedside Baptist, becomes a little bit too much too comfortable. And Pastor Pillow's words become more enticing than the preacher's words. So let's stop being complacent in our beds and get back to community. He says, don't neglect meeting together. Take the action of coming together constantly and even beyond the pandemic. We've got to remain in community with one another because there's safety in being in the flock. There's protection in being in the flock. So let's not avoid meeting together. And lastly, encourage one another. An action step here. Encouraging. If I'm complacent 
and what I'm doing, then I have no care for making sure anybody else feels good in their faith. It's really all about me. I'm more and more self-centered. It's it's all about me feeling good. Remember, part of the definition of complacency is a smug attitude about what you've achieved. And so it's you find it harder and harder to want to encourage other people when all you care about is what's going on in your own world. Action. We've got to take action. Hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. Trust God. Think of ways to motivate others. Commit acts of love and good work. Don't neglect meeting together and encourage one another. All actions. And what makes these actions commands a challenge is when we become more confident in the provisions over the provider. We get to the point in our faith where the blessings of God have provided so much for us, we feel like we no longer need the provider. We just start to become comfortable, just enjoying a lifestyle and never minding the life giver. Just like Simba, time goes by, we sink deeper into spiritual hakuna matata, avoiding our responsibility to be disciples who make disciples. Disciples participate in the will of God, and they want to pull others into that. When we become spiritually complacent, living the hakuna matata spirituality, we stop caring about being a part of what God is doing in the earth. The great theologian A.W. Tozer said this, complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. Say that again. Complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. There are three traps of complacency I want to uh, warn you about and help us to be aware of. Number one, The first trap is it cuts off communication. Complacency will cause us to stop interacting with God and possibly safe community. It cuts off communication. We have to be constantly talking to God because every step in our spiritual growth presents another opportunity for God to bring us to the next place that he is calling us to. Our salvation walk is walked out from the time we say we accept Jesus to the time of his return. And all in between there should growth should be happening. Don't let communication be cut off with you because you're trapped by complacency. The second thing complacency, the second trap of complacency is it breaks trust. We get to the point where we stop trusting God. We, we, we say, here's where I am in my trust with God and I'm going no further. This has happened. This is it. I'm not going any further in my trust with God. We become stuck. It's like being in quicksand and we're just we're just standing and we're sinking deeper and deeper in the place that we're in. We say, God, I no longer have a a reason to trust you to grow forward. The trap of complacency breaks, breaks trust with God and we can't afford that. As those who claim to be his children, his followers, believers, we can't afford to have broken trust between us and God. We need that trust. That trust helps us hold tightly. It helps us uh, think of ways to motivate others. It helps us commit acts of love. We have to have trust to continue forward in our faith walk. And last trap of um, complacency is it kills motivation. It kills the motivation to reach others. We're no longer concerned about anyone else coming to know Jesus. I know I've mentioned others several times throughout this teaching, but people are important to God. God wants his creation back and we're responsible for participating in that plan. God wants us back in communion with him. He wants to have relationship with us again. And as disciples, God's mission and agenda needs to be near and dear to our heart at all times. So we can't afford to not be motivated about reaching others. While God has called us to rest in the Sabbath, 
We don't get to check out on faith. The Sabbath is a part of kind of refreshing and refueling our faith. Take our time out on Sabbath, but then get back into the fight. We have a responsibility to live life concerned with a part that we play in keeping the kingdom in motion in both our lives and the lives of others. So in the movie, when Simba decides to be complacent, it does not affect him. It affects his home, which is Pride Rock. They suffer as well. The water dries up, order falls, the hyenas take over, and a once happy place flowing with life becomes dark. A once happy place flowing with life becomes dark. It's no different for us. When we become complacent, others suffer as a result of us not being in place. People lose access to the work of Jesus through us. And there are way too many opportunities for people to seek things that pull them away from God. Our spiritual complacency should not be one of those. So how do we overcome complacency? I'll give you three. One, examine your life for areas where you have become spiritually complacent. Look around. Where are you stuck at? Are you spiritually stuck complacent in your giving? Are you spiritually complacent in your living? Are you spiritually complacent in your marriage? You're praying for your, your spouse, praying for your family. Are you spiritually complacent in participating? Are you spiritually complacent in making disciples of others? Examine your life for areas where you have become spiritually complacent. Number two, confess your sins. Complacency is a sin. God has called us to grow. Sin is disobedience to God. When we become spiritually complacent, we are in a disobedient place to God, and we need to confess that. Whatever that looks like in your life, we have to bring it to the Lord and confess our sins. Keep the purpose of your life clear. Number three, you belong to God and he is he is at work in us. He's always at work in us, calling us to be more and more like Christ. That's the purpose that we need to keep clear in our hearts and minds at all times. We belong to God and he has called us to live and walk according to his purpose. Keep the, pur- keep the purpose clear. By the end of the movie, convinced by Nala that his, his would-be lioness, uh, he realizes that the Hakuna Matata lifestyle was not the way he's supposed to live. He returns to Pride Rock to restore order and take ownership of his responsibility as king. And I see three things that we can learn from Simba. Give you three R's that you can apply to your life as we go forward. Number one, repent. Ask God for forgiveness for you being in the stuck place that you have been in. Number two, reconnect. Come back to God and your community. Number three, resolve. According to James 1.8, to no longer be a double-minded man in your walk with God. Repeat, repent, reconnect, and resolve. And that's the way we break off and get, that's how we can apply this message of no longer being spiritually complacent to our lives. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word, your will, your way. I pray God for anyone who's out here right now and is hearing this message and has been struck in their spirit to respond. God, that they know it's time for them to repent to reconnect, and God, to resolve to no longer be double-minded in their walk with you. I pray for anyone who's in that stuck place that they will come out of it refreshed and ready to walk with you. I thank you for your kingdom coming and your will being done. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, thanks again for taking some time to be with us today. Whether you're joining us live or on demand, I'm happy that you were here. And I hope that after the teaching today, you're feeling God nudging your heart towards taking a next step. Maybe you've grown complacent in your relationship with God and it's led you to a place where you never really intended to go, but you're ready to turn that around and you want more information about going all in following Jesus. If that's you, would you grab your phone and text all in to the number that you see? I would love to follow up with you this week and send you some resources that can help you. Or maybe you're just feeling stuck and you would just like me to pray for you. I can do that too. Text the word prayer to that same number. Now, if you're a part of Grace Church and you wanna continue giving back to God and being generous towards others, you can text the word give and we can send you the link to do that. And if you find yourself in a place where you're in need, we can definitely help you. Just let us know. Shoot me a text to that same number. Now to wrap up our time here today, I'm gonna to leave you with a song to help refresh you and get you ready for this next week. I'll see you guys later. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful In all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire In darkest nights You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after it's running after me Your goodness is running after It's running after me With my life laid down I surrender now I give you everything Your goodness is running after It's running after me Oh, Your goodness is running after it's running after me Your goodness is running after It's running after me With my life laid down I surrender now I give you everything Your goodness is running after It's running after me All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness I will sing of the 
goodness of God.